Welcome to Metro STL. I'm Charles Jaco. We're pleased to be joined today by Richard Hine of the Hine Law Firm here in St. Louis as we talk about DACA. That is, of course, the delayed action for childhood arrivals program that was recently ruled essentially unconstitutional by a federal judge in Texas. Rick, thank you very much for being with us. We appreciate your time. Absolutely, Charles. Such a delight to be with you and with your viewers. Thank you very much for the invitation. First off, what was the legal reasoning of this federal judge in Texas tossing DACA out completely, saying it was unconstitutional? Well, you know, it's it's interesting. Um, the the basis, the, the legal foundation of the decision was the same as six years ago when this same judge opined in the same way, which is to say that the legal decision is based on what Judge uh, Hainan uh, down in Texas thought was a failure on the part of the Obama administration in June of 2012 to follow the um, Administrative Procedures Act, also known as the APA. The APA is a federal statute which requires any governmental entity which is going to establish new rules to go uh, through a process which is set out in that statute, in that law. Um, and essentially it allows for um, a publication of the proposed rule and then a certain amount of time, usually 60 days of um, public comment in order to have a, a form of public debate on the proposed rules. And when um, the Obama administration in uh, 2012 established the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals or DACA, D-A-C-A program, it did not uh, follow that procedure. It essentially uh, issued a memorandum. Uh, the head of the Homeland Security Department at that time issued a, a memorandum essentially setting up the, the scheme uh, by which, um, and I don't want to say scheme in a, in a negative sense of the, of the word, but rather the, the uh, structure of the program, uh, in order for um, those who uh, were able to complete and demonstrate by evidence uh, that they were in the country for five years at least, had arrived prior to their 16th birthday, did not have any prior criminal cases, or, or uh, if they did, they were minor, um, and um, also that they had uh, the opportunity to study or were then currently study or had graduated from a recognized institution or had uh, gotten their GED, if they had all these requirements uh, and were able to establish that uh, through the, uh, the filing and through the evidence that they presented, then they would be able to procure this uh, DACA approval um, and benefit from the DACA memorandum. They would also allow the, those recipients to apply for uh, labor uh, or employment uh, authorization and receive an employment authorization document, which would then be renewable for two years. So Judge Hainan had already ruled on this uh, six years ago and, and once again ruled uh, last Friday. All right. Because of, of the alleged fa a failure to, to follow that law, you've got roughly 600,000 people who were uh, given work permits in, and uh, at least temporary uh, freedom from being deported, who, who are hanging in limbo right now. Um, this leads to a lot of questions. The first is, on appeal, do you think the judge is, is going to be upheld and eventually Congress is going to have to rewrite DACA uh, in, in a quick hurry, or do you think that he'll be overturned and there's no great rush here? Well, you know, it's, it's interesting, Charles. Um, a year ago, just this past week in the Supreme Court, uh, had reestablished DACA. Uh, there was a case filed that uh, challenged the, the Trump administration's attempt to uh, disband the program. And the Supreme Court uh, said about a year ago that the Trump administration had also failed to follow the rules and re reset the program back to uh, when it went into effect on June 15th of 2012. However, there were three judges um, uh, who filed a dissenting opinion a year ago and said that the Supreme Court should have gone ahead and taken advantage of the opportunity to strike it down based on the same reasoning that Judge Hainan established in his 77 page decision uh, the other day. Now, uh, bear in mind that this case was filed in that court, I think for a specific reason. And the lead counsel on the case is Attorney General Bill Paxton of, uh, of Texas, who's currently under 
investigation for all kinds of uh, issues and, and among which are ethical violations having to do with his uh, uh, case challenging the election results in 2020. Having, having said that, however, this court uh, first instance, this federal judge uh, um, is part of the Fifth uh, Circuit Court of Appeals. The Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals is notoriously conservative. So my suspicion is that on appeal to the Court of Appeals in the Fifth uh, Circuit, this will be upheld and then it will get in front of the Supreme Court. Now, how long that will take? Probably at least a year, if not a, uh, a bit more than a year, probably looking at the end of 2022 or perhaps on into 2023. Uh, now, and getting... if the, I, I'm sorry, but if the Fifth Circuit upholds and SCOTUS upholds, uh, and this program is, is tossed out, what happens to these 600,000 people who are in it? Are they subject to being deported from the United States, even though they've lived here their entire lives? Yes, they are. And that's the whole point of this program. Um, when this was established in 2012, it was essentially, I think, um, and this is my interpretation, but the executive branch throwing up their hands saying Congress is not doing anything to try to resolve the situation for these folks who, mind you, were brought here as children. So in order to uh, you know, say that they are somehow at fault for being in the United States is completely misguided. And um, I think uh, people perhaps don't understand that when you're brought across the border as a seven, eight year old or up to a 15 year old, you don't have any decision in the matter. You don't have a real, real stake in the decision. And so these folks are by and large, well-educated, um, contributing members of society, paying taxes, um, and they're not so young anymore. Some of the, the older ones are, are even approaching 40 years of age. But there was never any, there was never any path in the DACA law, even if it was written. No. For them, to, for them to even become, ever become citizens, correct? That is correct. So I was asked a question about this uh, recently. And is this the protection that DACA provides to the DACA recipients? Is it something similar to those who benefit from protection under TPS, most recently those from uh, Venezuela and Liberia um, who have been protected uh, essentially because of the man-made disaster and economic, social, and political crisis occurring in, in Venezuela. Um, yes, the, the, the reason for, the, for DACA is to protect these folks against deportation. In the, grand, in the great majority of these cases, they don't speak their language of, of the country of origin. They don't remember their country of origin. They have no contacts in their country of origin. They are all, for intents and purposes, Americans, but without a piece of paper that says so. Okay, Rick, work with me on this. Let's assume with a conservative Supreme Court, conservative Fifth District, this gets tossed out. Uh, with uh, the GOP being adamantly against this program and immigration in general, but uh, this program specifically, it would seem to me, given the current climate in Washington, that these kids or these people may end up being deported because A, the court will overturn, I will uphold this, and B, there is no appetite in this Congress right now as it's presently constituted to write anything into law, certainly in the Senate, that would allow these people to maintain their current protections and eventually become citizens. If all that's true, uh, it looks like the situation might be pretty grim. Yeah, it's, it's not a favorable opinion. And I think there are about 600 or 650,000 people who are seriously worried about this. And bear in mind, that it's not just the individuals who are protected by this. It's also their American families. I mean, I have, I have friends who are married to uh, DACA recipients. They have children, they have jobs, they have houses, they are contributing to the society. They're important members of the society. Um, so it's, it's very troubling. Um, now, having said that, you know, even pres ex-president Trump said that he loved the dreamers and everybody loves the dreamers. And yet, uh, you know, in the course of his uh, four-year mandate was unable to do anything to, to help these folks. And really it's going to depend on the political will of the United States Congress in order to establish um, in, uh, in the code, because I remind, I'm, I remind you that this is not a law, this is an executive action uh, taken by executive order and memorandum, uh, memorandum issued by the executive branch. So it is not a law. And uh, the law would then need to be changed or uh, essentially um, re not rewritten, but 
but written and placed into uh, law. It passed by the Congress, you know, both houses, and then uh, passed on up to the president and signed in order to effectuate a permanent solution to the, to the situation. What a sort of effect is this having, having on uh, DACA recipients who may be clients, may be acquaintances of yours here in St. Louis? Well, bear in mind that the, the order that Judge Hainan signed on the 16th is um, uh, he essentially en enjoined the or, or prohibited the uh, Department of Homeland Security and USCIS, the United States Citizenship and Immigration Service, from taking any action on new applications. It's not to say that folks can't file new applications. They just won't have a decision taken on them. And he specifically, at least my reading of his of his uh uh, decision, my reading uh, indicates that those who are already uh, beneficiaries of the program and are filing for renewals can still continue to file and have adjudications uh, on their renewals. But, so given the, but given the political reality right now, I would imagine that uh, of these 650,000 people, almost all of them are worried, what's going to happen to me two, three, four years from now if uh, this is upheld by the courts. If no law is passed, if you get a Republican majority or a Republican president, it would seem that if they decided to take a Trumpian line on immigration, these people have lived here uh, all their lives, there is a really good chance in those circumstances, many of them could be rounded up and deported. Yeah, I mean, that's ultimately the, the greatest threat to the DACA recipients is deportation. Um, and I, I should uh, let your viewers know too that there have been cases of folks who have been uh, deported to their countries of origin. Uh, they go back to a society and a culture they don't know uh, in a language that they don't know. And oftentimes there's a very serious negative effect on their mental health. And uh, there's a high incidence of, of suicide on, on deportees uh, who have fallen into this sort of you know, catch 22 where they're for all intents and purposes, American citizens speak English just like you and I, and who have no uh, paperwork to support their presence in the United States. A couple of final questions then. Number one, where do you see things going from here? I mean, you said the solution is with Congress. Do you think a lobbying campaign, especially in the United States Senate, as it's presently constituted, would have any effect at all? Um, it's unlikely, uh, and it's it's really when when you talk about immigration law, you're talking about the perfect confluence of law and politics. So the bigger chunk of this, I think, is on the political side, um, and so I think the lobbying efforts have to be um, uh, sustained and and strong between now and whatever eventual uh, resolution is is arrived at, and I think it really needs to be focused on the humanitarian. Um, uh, leanings of the individual members of Congress and, and give personal explanations, uh, cite individual stories, highlight individual uh, recipients of DACA. Uh, there are, there are uh, attorneys who are, are DACA recipients. There are engineers who are DACA recipients. These are folks who are highly educated in a lot of the cases um, and, and in the majority of the cases at least have you know, undergraduate degrees and who are working and contributing to society. These are valuable members of the immigrant community and who really I think deserve because of no fault of their own, the fact that they're here, they deserve to have the full benefit of the, the bargain of citizenship in the United States. And final question, Rick, what, and look, you're a realist, you deal with these immigration matters all the time. I mean, realistically, what do you think the chances are that this turns out well? 50%, 80%, I mean, it just seems to me as an observer, that right now, from what we can see, the chances of this turning out well for, for these folks is not very good. Yeah, I, and I think really the answer is going to be at, during the elections. Uh, if this can be a, a, a motivating factor for folks to get to the polls, and I think the results of the elections are really going to be dictating how far this goes in, uh, in the Congress. So it, essentially, it's, it's a political issue right now, although it's still caught up in the courts. And, and again, this is a nine-year odyssey in the courts that's still going on um, with no resolution. And so the political will is, is, is either lacking or it's present. And it's gonna be dependent on, I think, on the outcome of the next two uh, elections, the next two congressional elections. Richard Hine of the Hines Law Firm here in St. Louis. Rick, a real pleasure. Thank you very much for being with us. Absolutely, such a delight to be with you. Thank you so much for the invitation.